Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Safe Shelter Collaborative Building Your Agency's Donor Base. As we begin to get started, I just want to make sure I thank everyone for attending today. My name is Susan Hope Bard, and I'll be facilitating our webinar today. We do want this presentation to be relevant to the very important work that you do in your agencies. So I want to thank you in advance for answering our survey at the end of the webinar so we can continue to develop content just like this to continue to meet your agency's needs. Um, as I walk through our platform, I do want to give a shout out to everybody that's joining us. Um, if you could please um, chat in where you are joining us from, um, your city and state, because I know we have invited a lot of folks from around the country. So go ahead and give us a shout out where you're from. I am sitting here with some of your Safe Shelter Collaborative support staff here in beautiful San Francisco. It's a little overcast today and a little drizzly, so I'm wearing a sweater. But um, it's, it's been pretty sunny the rest of the week. I am going to go ahead and talk to you a little bit about the platform that we're using today for this webinar, in case anyone's not familiar with it. Um, I want you to be comfortable using the platform. There is a chat box at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. So what we want you to do at any time at all, chat us to let us know if you're having any problems viewing or hearing the audio. The chat box is also for your questions. So if Michael or Lee, our two amazing presenters, are talking and you want to ask a question, don't wait till the Q&A section. You can go ahead and chat it in at any time. If you lose your Internet connection, you can reconnect using the link in your registration or the reminder email that we sent out about an hour ago. And if you registered more than about an hour ago, you can also access the presentation slide deck that we sent with the reminder email. Um, keep in mind that, that this session is going to be recorded and you'll be able to access this afterwards. If you're hearing an echo through your computer speakers or having any issues with audio, you can dial in using that toll-free number that we supplied. You are being recorded. So why we uh, mute all of the phones except for the presenters is so that we can get a good clear recording without any background distractions. Um, the recording will be available for you in a few days. We will notify you by email when the recording is available for viewing. And the great news is all of the amazing resources that Michael and Lee have put together will be contained in that email. So we'll have links to these great articles, some sample templates that Lee has given us. So you'll be able to access all of this for your use in your agency. All right, I see lots of folks chatting in where they're from. Go ahead and let us know. Someone, Denise here from California as well. Great. The rest of you, go ahead and give us a shout out in the chat box where you, where you are joining us from, your city and state. And as you do that, let me introduce our speakers, our presenters today. Um, we're very fortunate to have these two volunteer presenters. The first is Michael Stein. Michael has been a writer and digital strategist to progressive social causes for over two decades. He is the author of three books and has numerous articles chronicling the rise of digital marketing, mobile, and online fundraising. He also has a lot of articles about building donor support and fundraising, which are featured on our TechSoup website, and we'll supply you with links to those articles. He works as a consultant and coach to nonprofits, foundations, and educators, with a focus on marketing and fundraising in a multi-channel and multi-screen world. You can find him on Twitter at mstein63. Also joining us today is Lee, the Development Director at Mosaic Family Services Incorporated in Dallas, Texas. Lee has a passion for working with various nonprofits and NGOs to strengthen communities, advance social justice, and to overall provide a positive impact on the world. She has a diversified skill set involving her social background work, her social work background and fundraising experience. She has a bachelor's of social work degree and a master of social work degree with a specialization in children and families and intimate partner violence from Baylor University. 
her undertakings with Family Abuse Center, reading partners, and communities and schools have provided her with a unique look at working with vulnerable, oppressed, and discriminated populations. And in 2015, Lee received the Heartbeat Award from the United Way of the Metropolitan Dallas. Also joining us is Su Lan Chang, the Assistant Director of Family Violence and Human Trafficking at Mosaic Family Services, and she'll be helping to answer some of our agency's questions. And I'm at the bottom there. I'm just going to be your facilitator. I work here at TechSoup and Caravan as the Training and Education Manager. And even more importantly, on our back end here supporting this webinar and supporting the Safe Shelter Collaborative are Ricky Abisla with Caravan Studios and Sarah Washburn also with Caravan Studios. And helping with all of the technical challenges or any difficulties you have is Tiffany Myers. So when you chat to, to folks, um, that's who will be responding to you, our support team. So we want to thank you very much for joining us again. So I'm going to talk for a few seconds about the Safe Shelter Collaborative. The Safe Shelter Collaborative is developed jointly by Polaris and Caravan Studios, which is a division of TechSoup here in San Francisco. The Collaborative is a growing community-based network of nonprofits, funders, government agencies, and individual donors that's designed to provide faster access to more shelter for a greater diversity and number of survivors of human trafficking. And for those of you who may wonder, well, what does the Safe Shelter Collaborative do? There are three main parts. The first is the Safe Shelter Collaborative increases the capacity of organizations like you to offer survivor-centered, trauma-informed care to human trafficking survivors. And we also provide technology to maximize the ability to find available and appropriate shelter space. And in fact, Agencies that were using our technology, specifically SafeNight, influenced the creation of this webinar today. So your feedback to us helped us determine um, content of this webinar so we could assist you in continuing to, uh, to achieve your mission. And then lastly, the Safe Shelter Collaborative offers a means to source funding for a hotel room when that is an appropriate and safe option for the survivor. As I mentioned, it was built by Caravan and Polaris. And here are some of our funders. I have two more short things to chat out to you that I'm going to need you to participate in. We have two live polls. In order for us to get a better idea of the agencies that are on this webinar today, we're going to ask you two questions. So what you're going to do is in, your, in the webinar right now, you'll see there's a choice. Is your agency an active Safe Shelter Collaborative member? Yes, no, but I want to know more, or you're not sure. Go ahead and click on the response that best reflects your agency's situation. And I will give you a few seconds to do that. And then I'm going to count down five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. Great. So it looks like the majority of folks on this call, 90% of you are already an active Safe Shelter Collaborative member. Thank you. And those of you who aren't, we will reach out to you after this webinar and we'll be able to connect with you directly. One more quick question before I turn it over to Michael. And this one is, how many addresses does your agency have representing your constituent database. So think about this. Um, and you may not know the answer, and that's okay. So do you have less than 100 email addresses? 100 to 200? 201 to 5? More than 5? Or you just may, may be unsure. So take a moment. I'll leave the poll open for you to select. I'll wait for a few more responses. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, great. So, and that's perfectly fine if you're unsure because Michael is going to be addressing some of this when he talks about developing and sustaining your donor base. Um, but we just wanted to have an idea of what that range was. So great. Thank you so much for answering those questions. 
And without further ado, I am going to turn this over to Michael Stein, and he will begin talking about building and nurturing an active donor base. So please join me in welcoming Michael. Michael, the floor is yours. <laughs> the virtual floor. Um, thank you so much, Susan, and thanks to everybody uh, for, for uh, inviting me to join today. Um, Susan um, asked me to talk um, uh, about building and nurturing an active donor base and really to talk in a, in a fairly general way about um, you know, how, how, to, how to grow your, um, your donor relationships and your donor prospects. And let me actually go to my little slides. I forgot to do that. My apologies. Let me see here. Do I have to close the poll? Oh, there it is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Still learning how to use the, uh, the little things here. Okay, great. Um, so let me just quickly jump to um, – so what I'd like to cover today is basically the whole donor development process in the 15 minutes that we have. Um, so I'll be covering – and I just want to quickly cover um, the different pieces of the puzzle that I'll be talking about. Um, so for, start, for starters, we're going to be talking about – um, the importance of growing your list, which is why we sent out that little poll earlier to ask about the size of your list. We're then going to talk about the process of cultivating and engaging year-round with all of your different constituents, whether they're volunteers or subscribers or followers or donors. Then I'm going to talk about the, different, the importance of the different types of giving opportunities um, that should be placed in front of people, both online and offline, um, to develop the donor base. And then I will wrap up talking a little bit about the importance of developing kind of a, what I'm calling a culture of welcoming donors, thanking them, and acknowledging them. So this was just a quick little um, agenda of what I'm going to be talking about um, in the next 15 minutes. And there should be plenty of time um, at the end if you have questions. And of course, you can ask things in the chat. Um, throughout the whole hour, uh, and I'm happy also to uh, respond separately with email exchanges or, um, or whatever works for folks. So let me start out by talking about the donor prospecting process. And I think um, this is really just such an important piece of the puzzle. I mean, the basic um, philosophy is that, you know, to develop a donor base at the core, what you, do, what you have to do is you have to grow your list of prospects. And so, Organizations often say to me, you know, gee, Michael, that sounds great, but I just don't really know where to start, or I only have 500 names, or, you know, we're an agency that's just beginning, or, um, or the names are really old, and we get a lot of, you know, bounces and all this kind of stuff. And so I think, you know, what I tell people is that the donor prospecting process is something that happens all year round and all the time, and that you have to kind of tackle it in a couple of different ways. And so I put a list up here on the screen of sort of, you know, kind of my kind of favorite sort of six ways to grow your list. So I think um, obviously, uh, you know, encouraging people that are coming to your website to uh, leave their email address uh, because they're either going to get an email newsletter or they want to stay connected to your work. So that's one of the most important um, sort of prospecting mechanism. I mean, I think most people know that when they leave their email address that you may be asking them eventually for money, but oftentimes people are just genuinely interested in learning about you, keeping you know, in touch with you. So that's really uh, an important place to start. I know that most of, I've looked at most of your websites and pretty much all of you have that, but I saw many of your websites that didn't have a place for people to leave their email address. Um, obviously, people that attend any of your real-world events um, whether they're a gala or an event you're doing in the community or what, whatever that may be, just so important to have sign-up boards, um, sign-up sheets, and that kind of stuff. Um, another place, of course, is uh, trying uh, basically connect, getting the information from people who've used the Safe Night app. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, obviously, followers on social media. You're obviously you want to get people to like you on Facebook or follow you on Twitter or other platforms, but also you can ask people in those, um, in those channels to leave you their email address. Um, so any way that you can um, prospect over there. 
Um, also, your volunteers are incredibly important members of your community, and so they also constitute kind of a prospect pool. And also, they have many friends and family members and others um, that you can connect with through them. And then, of course, your board members, who are some of your most important volunteers, and I think they also constitute either themselves a type of donor prospect, or they can be terrific to help reach out um, and reach other people and add them to your list and that kind of stuff. I've seen people do some fun stuff like, well, they'll designate like one month of the year as let's build our prospect list as big as possible and kind of do a little bit of a, um, like kind of a friendly competition among board members and volunteers and others to see who can help add you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 email addresses to the, or mailing addresses to the file. So you have to kind of make it a little bit fun, um, but really think about it doing it all the time. And last but not least, you know, business and corporate partners. I know many of you have those kinds of relationships, and many businesses and corporate partners are often really excited to, to, to help um, build your file. Um, um, and so, you know, teaming up with them to send a message to their employees or to maybe doing something at an event they're doing. Um, so, those, so these are all the different pieces of the puzzle um, that I think play into um, the, list, the list growing process. Um, you can also, um, uh, you know, do list exchanges with other or like-minded organizations. Um, if you have a little bit of budget, you know, you can approach publishers like Mother Jones or Alternet, and they can send, um, they, for a fee, they'll often send, you know, a message on your behalf to their readers and subscribers. So there, there are definitely other options. But, you know, everything that's on this list right here on the screen is basically free. So the donor prospecting process is just so important. Uh, and important to do all year round. Click to the next one. Great. Um, another piece of the puzzle of um, nurturing an active donor base is really the cultivation and engagement process. And I've been on many of your Facebook pages and some of your YouTube pages and others, and I can see that you all do such an incredible job telling the stories about the work that you're doing in the community. And so I just from the vantage point of nurturing a donor base, it's just those stories are just so important to reinforce, you know, how donor support really makes a difference. Um, and so I just want to encourage everyone to, to keep doing that and always to be mindful that every time you, you, you take the effort to find a photograph or to get a quote from someone or to tell the story or to make a video, um, each one of those, you know, adds up and it's just so important in connecting with donors. Um, and hence the term donor-centric language is always, always being thoughtful of just not you know, writing from the first person, like we've done this, um, we, you know, we, we helped this person, but really reframing it as like, you know, with the support from our donors, we are able to do X or we're able to do Y, and really being mindful that it's the donor um, that enables all, of this, all these programs to happen. Um, obviously, um, Sending email updates and sending email newsletters um, is another critical part of that cultivation engagement that you're doing. Some of you may have print newsletters or print mailings that go out as well. All of those are going are to add up. Um, another one that I want to mention here is um, creating a, an email welcome series for new subscribers. It's just so important for the folks who are first kind of joining with you. They're already in the community. They find out about your organization. They pass through their mailing address or their email address. It's just so important to connect with them immediately in this kind of cultivation mode um, and to thank them for, for, for you know, getting closer to you and here's what we want to um, do together. There's volunteer opportunities. There'll be donor opportunities and really um, just open, open the door for them as much as you possibly can. Um, and of course, you know, the cultivation engagement, um, can, it can also happen through um, all the channels at your disposal. I, I spent like a half a day the other day just perusing through um, Facebook pages, which is really such a rich medium um, to find photographs and stories and links and hashtags and, and everything else. And just, I, I, you, know, that, you know, it's just becoming such a rich place. Um, you can, I've seen so many creative uses of, um, of social media, for example, in uh, thanking uh, specific donors for making certain gifts or um, getting people excited about um, a fundraising campaign that might be coming up 
or showing how a campaign is being enabled by a certain um, donor or group of donors or funder, but really just trying to find sort of creative ways to be involved on social media um, and really to find you know, a, a positive donor language and a positive donor kind of storytelling um, that you can do really pretty much all year round. Tony, I, there's one little example here from the Larkin Street Youth Services. Sorry, it's a little bit small on the screen, but I'm sure you can find that um, pretty easily on social media that talked about um, what some uh, gift from a donor had enabled, and I thought that was just a, ter a terrific example. And then, of course, I'm sure many of you are doing um, print mailings, um, you're doing telephone calls, uh, in-person events. All of those contribute to developing an actor's active donor base, and sometimes, um, as with telephone calls or print materials, you're not always soliciting money. You are um, getting people, um, you're giving people updates on, um, you know, what their what their support is enabling, um, and it's just so important to um, to connect with them in as many different um, types of channels um, that are that are that are available to you. Great. I just wanted to quickly share, we're going to talk about giving opportunities and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up my portion, but I just wanted to show this, this famous kind of ladder of donor engagement, sometimes it's called a pyramid. And I think it's just a really helpful way also to visualize kind of the, kind of the, the, the building of the donor base process. So kind of at the bottom of this pyramid, you have kind of this universe of prospects. You're building your list. You're getting people onto your file. You're collecting as many people to be in touch with. Um, and then as you, you kind of move people up the proverbial pyramid or up the ladder of engagement, you know, your first task is to get people to become a first-time donor, um, either on the phone or an email or door-to-door -door contact. And then your next challenge in the green slice is to get people to make a second gift or to upgrade to a larger gift um, or to become like a monthly donor. So really just pushing them up another level. And then of course the last three stages could be pushing them into even more um, special donor uh, groupings, uh, people making you know, more sizable gifts or people getting excited about some of your capital campaigns or people um, leaving bequests and all that kind of stuff. But I know that for a lot of organizations, you know, most of the work really happens in those sort of first three tiers building your prospect list, getting first-time gifts, and then getting renewals um, or, or upgrades. Um, so um, I'll just, just three or four minutes on this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up. So I think, I think you know, the, most, you know, the next important piece of the puzzle in building the donor base is really just creating giving opportunities. And this is really where it comes down to um, – how do you engage all these people on your list to make gifts, how to get people to make another gift, how to get people to upgrade, and really um, focusing your efforts on creating these seasonal fundraising campaigns. There are so many opportunities during the year um, that you can take advantage of. We're, of course, um, approaching Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We've got Giving Tuesday and year-end times. Um, and I think each organization um, – kind of develops a, a sort of a technique for creating these giving opportunities. Um, it's really interesting to see how different organizations do this. I mean, obviously the year end is the, is the most common time, but that's, you know, but the, the challenge I think is finding other times in the year when you can build seasonal campaigns and get your supporters and donors excited about, you know, oh, I'm going to contribute to this annual fund again this year because it was so successful last year. Or, oh, yes, gosh, it's, it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month. That's a really important um, time of the year for, for us. You know, let's, let's, you know, for me, I want to I I kind of be part of that. Um, so just so important to, to craft these, um, these seasonal fundraising campaigns. Or, you know, sometimes the campaigns can be, can be urgent in nature, um, which is always unfortunate that you have to raise money for something urgent. Uh, but that can also fit into the mix. Hey, we have a you know, we, we, we have an urgent situation here in our city or in our state, and can, can you help us out? And um, I think, you know, these engagement techniques that I've listed here are really um, some, of the key, some of the key things to think about um, that will help to make these giving opportunities come to life. And you're probably familiar with most of these. So, um, you know, a matching gift. One of your board members is, you know, going to double the gifts if you give by Sunday or by the end of the month. Um, 
creating deadlines, like, well, we really sure need the money so that we can um, do X or Y, um, or, um, you know, monthly giving is also important. People sometimes aren't able to give a gift of 100 to 200 dollars, but they might at one time, but they might be willing to give, you know, five or ten dollars a month over a long time. So those are uh, so matching gift deadlines and monthly giving are engagement techniques that are that are just so 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 critical um, to really develop um, a, a donor base. Um, and then of course, you know, on your website, uh, using you know any any kind of technique that you can to get people to the donation page, um, you might have everything from uh, a, a video that draws people in the donation page itself. You know, you can craft different kinds of options there for giving um, um, legacy gifts, um, one-time gifts, all that kind of good stuff. And then, of course, um, you know, doing as much promotion as you can on your social media channels and really kind of blending um, all, all of these together, testing different techniques at different times of the year and seeing um, – what what is going to you know work best for your uh, for your constituency, and let, and I'll just end with a couple of um, couple of final things, and then I'll open it up for questions, and we'll and we'll pass it on. So I think I think you know the top thing that I that I usually um, suggest that people do is really spending time focusing as much as possible on acquiring the first time donors because that's just usually the hardest kind of piece of the puzzle. So you know you have your prospect pool, and then you know trying to think of some creative way that what, what, what gets people in the door to make, a first, to make a first gift? Is it a small amount of $10? Is it a monthly gift of $5 a month? Is it, you know, hey, make a gift and we'll send you a calendar or um, some, kind of a, some kind of a premium that makes you excited, something you'd wear, a T-shirt to show your connection um, to, to the work. Another one that I'm really interested in exploring and discussing with everybody here is, you know, how to also explore deeper engagement with the Safe Night app, donor, app donors, and I had asked Susan actually before the call um, if folks actually had access to uh, emails of people who have downloaded the Safe Night app or made donations through the Safe Night app to fund, you know, hotel stays. And I think there's something really interesting in there. Obviously, if someone has already made a donation um, to fund a hotel room through the app, they're already a donor, and so they've already kind of indicated their interest in, um, in the cause and in your work of your agency. And so I think there's um, some interesting opportunities in there perhaps to send follow-up emails um, to get people excited maybe to make a follow-up gift um, or to become a monthly donor. They might not be able to always um, support Safe Night at requests, but um, you know, maybe they'd be willing to um, continue on with the, with, with, with the process. Uh, of becoming, uh, of developing into a, a stronger donor for you. Um, thinking multi-channel, I mean, just so important um, to not just think online and also not to just think real world or direct mail, but really just try to consider any, any donor that you work with or a prospect um, that you should try to stay in touch with them through as many channels as you possibly can. So if you do have their mailing address, you should be contacting them that way. If you have their email, you should do that. And that really, uh, when, when you are able to communicate in a multi-channel way, definitely improves um, your ability to, to, to raise money from folks. Um, yes, very important to be concerned about donor burnout. I think every organization has to use their own judgment to think about what's the right amount of, right amount of messaging. Um, and you don't have to appeal, you know, send fundraising appeals to everyone all the time and really being kind of thoughtful about you know, really how to, how to segment your, your donor, donor audience and how you might talk to them differently at different times of the year. And then again, just, you know, re recapping the importance of the donor-centric messaging and really, you know, finding a language, finding a voice um, that, that makes, you know, people feel really comfortable um, be, be, becoming a donor um, and not being stigmatized for either not being a donor, um, but really sort of treating everyone as part of the same um, the same adventure that you're on uh, uh, to support uh, people in the community and just being excited that, um, that donors are willing to step forward um, and, you know, take, take an extra step. I will pause there because I'm looking at my clock and I'm at 18 minutes. That's great, Michael. You've shared a tremendous amount of information. Um, 
And um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, one's related to uh, a topic you just touched on, the um, donor burnout. Um, do you have any recommendations for our agency in terms of, uh, you mentioned it's highly individualized by agency by agency, but are there any best practices to, to kind of follow in terms of outreach and burnout? Maybe one thing that I'll mention. I think the one thing about about um, burnout is is really to create a balance between the amount of kind of cultivation you're doing with donors and the amount of fundraising appeals. So you know, oh, it, 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 you should never be asking more than you're you know than you're giving to people, right? And and really just creating that balance. So when you know when I look at someone's fundraising program, I say you know, how many fundraising appeals, you know, did you send out last year combining telephone, mail, and, and email? And they'll say, well, I don't know, it was eight or something. I made that number up. And I'll say, well, how many cultivational touches did you have that were not fundraising related? And I, I, in, my, in my book, you know, they should be, you know, the, the fundraising shouldn't overwhelm the cultivation stuff. They should either be in balance um, uh, or, or there should be, you know, more cultivation than fundraising. So I, you know, I, that, that's sort of like my kind of rule of thumb kind of approach to it. Um, but, but it is, you know, to some extent, uh, you know, you, you have to be a little bit thoughtful, and I think each organization has to sort of throttle um, the amount of fundraising that's, that's appropriate for different times of the year. But, you know, th there are some organizations that, you know, raise, you know, 80% of their funds in December, which kind of boggles the mind. But there could be other months of the year where you could spend some time trying to focus, you know, maybe on one month, the month of October or the month of April to try to spread it out a little bit. Um, anyway, that's my, that's my quick response to that, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and one other question. Uh, for, you mentioned something about um, first-time donors, and um, many of our agencies, um, as at Lee will address this shortly about, you know, um, how they developed, sustained, and, and built their their donor base, um, but what about trying to get to those first time donors? How do you reach the folks that you, the non traditional donors to to get them to become a first time donor? What do you mean by non traditional donors? I'm sorry. I think I think what I mean is like the the person, or perhaps how do you reach out to someone or to an audience that you may not have tapped before? It kind of goes hand in hand with the burnout. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it comes back to our th that first slide when we were talking about donor prospecting, and I really think that it kind of all. Let me bring that slide back. I think it all kind of, kind of starts there. Let me see if I can get it to come back. Um, I mean, I think you know that if you're going to reach non-traditional people or if you're going to expand your audience, it's going to start here. It's going to start with how creative can you be. Um, to go out into the community, into the larger space, and, and, and try to connect with people? Is it going to be through some of your board members, maybe some of your business partners, um, et cetera, or through an event you're holding, or through some partnership you have with a publishing agency? So it, it's really here that it's going to happen. It's going to be in that kind of prospecting process, which, again, is going to happen all year round. You can partner with different people to try different things, but this is where it's going to start right here. Got it. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll have more questions as we move forward with Lee's presentation. Um, our next presenter is Lee from Mosaic Family Services. And before I turn it over to her, I just want to also mention that we have Sulan on the back end who will also, is also here to answer your questions. So um, Lee, go ahead and take it away. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? You are perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, I am so excited to be with you all today. Um, my name is Lee, and I'm the Development Director for Mosaic. I oversee all our fundraising and communication um, efforts to maintain and develop our budget. And Sue Lan, who's also on the call, um, is our Assistant Director of Family Violence and Human Trafficking. So she coordinates um, really anything within our programs, you name it. She wears a lot of hats. Um, and she also coordinates all the logistics for Safe Night and how we use it. Um, so she'll be available at the end if anyone has any specific questions um, related to how we use Safe Nights with our clients. 
So first, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to briefly go over our services at Mosaic. Um, I think this will give you a better understanding of how we've chosen our criteria for using Safe Night with our hotline callers and how this all relates to our donors. Um, Mosaic is a safe haven for survivors of human rights abuses, including refugees and survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking. We also provide comprehensive and culturally competent services to all our survivors in one place. Um, so this includes shelter, counseling, case management, legal representation, and support services in more than 30 languages. Um, our shelter, which we call Mosaic House, um, can hold up to 46 women and children at any time. And we have 10 bedrooms. Just to give you some general statistics of um, the clients that we've served in our shelter over the last few years, in 2014, um, we served 198 clients. In 2015, we served 278 clients. And lastly, as we wrap up fiscal year 16 this month, we project to have served approximately 300 survivors this year. Um, so those numbers are strictly just for clients who have lived in our shelter. And as you can tell, um, even though those numbers are pretty large for all of Dallas, which is where Mosaic is located, um, it really isn't that big. Um, and I will go into that later on as we continue with this. So when we first heard about Safe Night, um, our team was very excited about the resources that it could help us provide um, for all our clients. One of the biggest things that we've always lacked here is um, our ability to provide emergency hotel stays for clients, especially since we can only hold um, 46 clients in our shelter. Every month we are constantly turning away several different clients who need the help, but we just didn't have either the space or the funds to um, put them in emergency hotels. Um, emergency hotels. So we really wanted to figure out how we could use Safe Night to provide this as a resource for some of our clients. Naturally, and I'm sure just like everyone else on this call, we had several hesitations, and I just want to um, go ahead and list a few of them. So some of the initial hesitations we had when we first found out about Safe Night was, how, um, you know, we have a small donor base, so we already feel like we overuse them. How do we avoid burning out our donors with Safe Night if we're continuing to ask for more funds? Um, other questions involved, how does it work? What staff would be in charge of it? What criteria will we use to determine which clients are receiving the hotel funding? How do we determine that um, criteria? Where do we even get the funds to cover hotel beds while we wait to get reimbursed? And how do we even pay for this up front? So one of our biggest hesitations we were concerned about with Safe Night was burning out our donors. And initially when we thought that the app was great and we were so excited to use it um, since our clients are always in need of um, shelter and hotel beds. However, we already felt like we ask our donors for so much all the time. We always have some campaign going on or some need or some event going on. So in order for us to use Safe Night to meet the needs of our clients and the community as well as to avoid burning out our donors, um, we established a strict um, internal criteria for which, for which clients we use Safe Night funds with. So these are um, so some of our examples of our eligibility criteria include um, we wanted to ensure that the clients we are funding met our shelter eligibility criteria. We wanted to ensure, of course, that they were actually a domestic violence um, survivor, that they were fleeing immediate danger and or living in an unstable situation, and lastly, that space would be available at our shelter within a week or they were male survivors. And so also, um, we also establish criteria, specific criteria for the hotels we are using. So this included, um, of course, we wanted to put our clients in decent hotels, and we all know that you know, the um, decent hotels cost more money. So we also um, you know, wanted to um, value a family size. So if we had you know, a large family, we didn't want to stick them in a one-bedroom hotel. We also wanted to um, in include any special requests coming from the clients or maybe the proximity of the hotel. So maybe the client was looking for a hotel that was near um, his or her work or near his or her school. So we wanted to take that into factor. And lastly, one other thing um, that we had to think about is that whenever we're working with hotels, um, hotels that allow third-party payments end up costing more money. So 
for all of these factors, um, we decided for us in terms of asking our donors for um, funds to cover these is we wanted to break up our requests into smaller increments to appeal to donors. So on the Safe Night app, it only allows donors to donate the amount um, that you request. And so for instance, um, an average hotel in Dallas would cost $100. Well, instead of us just sending out a request for $100, um, instead we would send out two $50 Safe Night requests. Or maybe even, I, I think when we first started Safe Night, um, we were unsure if someone would even spend $50 for us. So we ended up sending out three um, $33 requests. So we definitely wanted to um, break our hotel requests into smaller increments to appeal to donors, and also that way we don't burn out our donors. Um, I think our, our rationale behind that is for a lot of people, they want to help, and they want to help um, survivors get back on their feet, but someone may not feel comfortable spending $100, even $150 on a hotel. However, um, especially when you're trying to appeal to new donors, they would feel comfortable um, donating to smaller requests. So here are some general statistics about Dallas and um, Mosaic and what we see here. So in 2014 and 2015, 7,567 victims were turned away in Dallas due to a lack of resources. Um, Mosaic is currently and just wrapped up our first year with Safe Night, and we have 102 donors registered on Safe Night for Mosaic. Um, and each year, or I'm sorry, each month we have turned away approximately 50 hotline calls. So that includes 50 families um, that we're turning away each month due to a lack of resources or lack of space. And in the last year, we've used Safe Night 22 times to request hotel funding. Again, I do want to emphasize that this has been um, a kind of a trial phase for Mosaic the first year just because we really didn't know what to expect or how our donors would perceive helping us out. Um, and so we definitely will, moving forward, continue to use Safe Night more, especially because there are over 7,000 victims in Dallas who need help and need shelter resources. So what makes us successful? I'm, the next few slides I'm going to go into um, will give you tips on how to um, engage your donors as well as appreciate your donors and even recruit more donors. Um, so I do want to note that our Safe Night requests are usually funded within an hour, um, sometimes in 10 minutes. It really just depends. Um, so one of the big things that we try to in, encourage all our staff to do is to talk about Safe Night during any outreach opportunity, during site visits with funders, during board meetings, and to all your donors and volunteers, and also to help down, donors download it with, when you're with them. So this is a picture of us um, helping one of our donors download the app while they're sitting at our shelter. Um, this actually for us comes very naturally because we have found that when we are giving donors um, a tour of our shelter, that one of the big questions that always comes up is, you know, what, what do you guys do whenever you're full? Do you turn people away? Do you have a waiting list? Um, and that is our, you know, our segue, our moment to turn it over to Safe Night and to introduce the app and tell them about it. We also have a page on our website just solely dedicated to Safe Night. Um, and here is a screenshot of what our website looks like. Um, so you can go to mosaicservices.org backslash Safe Night, and it gives you um, not only just you know, what Safe Night is, but it also gives you um, statistics. It gives you an example of how you can help. It gives you a direct link for you to download the app. So we've um, included a direct link for Apple users and also for Android users. Um, and then we've also, as you can tell, have put up specific instructions on how to select Mosaic. Um, you know, and um, just, again, simple information um, to help donors have a clear idea of what Safe Night is, how to use it, and how we use it. We also include Safe Night in our newsletters. So you can tell this is also a screenshot of a newsletter we've sent out over the past year. Um, where on the sidebar 
it gives an example, again, of statistics, how you can help, and what Safe Night is. Um, again, in this we've also included a direct link in our newsletter, so that way people can easily um, download the app without having to go and search for it in their app store. We also use Safe Night on Twitter and social media, all our social media um, channels. And so this is an example of something we've tweeted out um, a couple of tweets last year on what Safe Night is and how to use it. It also, the first tweet also um, recognizes that you know whenever we sent out our first request, it was fulfilled within for the first two minutes. So that's another key thing is um, one thing that we're big on is we never want to release, especially in a a specific tweet or a specific Facebook post, we very rarely will recognize a donor in it just because of confidentiality. Um, but we did, you know, in case that donor is following us on Twitter, we did want to acknowledge that we received their donation. Here is two screenshots of two Facebook posts that we've put out um, on about Safe Night. The one on the left is actually the first Facebook post we ever put about Safe Night, again showing a clear example of how to download it and what it is. On your right, um, it again recognizes that donor who provided the donation within that first two minutes. It also happened to be the same month as Domestic Violence Awareness Month, so it was a great way for us to also include that in our social media campaign. Um, lastly, I want to show you guys um, some statistics of our Safe Night donors. So surprisingly, 76% um, of our Safe Night donors are new donors. These are people who have never done any work about Mosaic before, or and, and have never done any work with Mosaic before, and who currently were not on our donor list. And 24% of those people um, were reoccurring donors. Now, of course, we did have um, a lot of pitfalls and concerns um, with downloading Safe Night. So I've already gone over burning out donors. That is something, um, especially in year one, where we wanted to avoid, which is why we only sent out 22 requests this past year, just because, again, we were unsure of how our donors would perceive it. The scary thing with Safe Night is that you know the agency pays up front. So we knew, and how we work is we tell the clients up front that we will go ahead um, and let them stay in a, in a hotel for either one or two nights max unless more funding comes in. And so that was the hard part for us is we had to find funds and resources to pay for up front, and it just really is never guaranteed whether or not a donor will come in. Um, and then also we have a very small budget for emergency assistance, and this not only includes just hotel stays but also you know, whether a client needs bus passes, emergency transportation, or um, prescription medication, any of those items. So we wanted to, um, you know, just make sure that we were being realistic with everything. And then I also want to give you some examples on how you can recognize your donors. Um, one of our big things is storytelling. Um, and Michael's uh, one of his slides, he had a screenshot of one of our Facebook posts that we actually did last week for us to just do storytelling. I think for donors, um, you know, donors are usually happy to help and want to help us in any way we can, but when you put a story with what they've done and when you can put, um, you know, trigger that emotional response from your donors, they're more likely to continue donating and staying on your donor list than just being a one-time donor. Um, so this is just an example of something that we've sent out to our donors before. And here's a photo of um, a client that we have included in one of our newsletters. Again, this goes along with storytelling, um, photos and uh, explaining some type of story or background about a client is always going to be more compelling than just sending a general thank you to someone. We also recognize our donors um, in our annual report. So this is a screenshot of a, um, one of our, a few of our donors that we have recognized in our most recent annual report. Um, so again, you know, I highly encourage recognizing donors any way you can, whether it's an email, a newsletter, social media, and a report. Um, just you know, the more you recognize your donors and the more you make them feel valued and appreciated, the more they're um, willing to return and donate again. 
This is a um, screenshot of an email that Sue Lan on our team has actually sent directly to a donor. Um, to be honest, we, we just have a template that we send out to all our donors and we copy and paste every time we get a new a Safe Night donation. Um, I've sent that over to, um, to Susan and she is going to actually email that out to everyone so that way um, in case you guys would like to use the same template or even change up the wording a little bit, you guys are more than welcome to. But we try to send this immediately after someone makes a donation so that way not only are they being recognized, but they also um, are getting that fast, quick response. And that's it for my end. That was fabulous, Lee. That was amazing. Thank you so much. What a great illumination on some of the things that Michael touched on earlier. In a general sense, you made all of this very specific to our agencies and meaningful to all of the agencies on the call right now. Um, it is important. We have um, plenty of time for Michael and Lee and Sulan to answer your questions. Um, I want everyone to feel free to chat those into the chat box and also to reinforce to you that we, we have curated a lot of resources for you that you will get in an email. Um, Michael has, I, I guess, I, I'm Michael, I'm just I, like more than 10 articles um, that we have up about fundraising and donor um, development on TechSoup's website, and we will be giving folks links to those so they can continue to look at those throughout the year for tips and tricks. And um, Lee has provided us, and we do have some questions. Um, Lee has provided us with a lot of resources as well, which we will also include in that follow-up email, including that um, template that you can use or modify for your own agency. So here's a question. Um, have Safe Night donors ever converted into regular donors or vice versa? So, so Lee, if you and Sue Lan, um, either one of you, um, if you, if you know the answer to this or could address that, that would be fabulous. Yeah, so we take all of the email addresses from our donors on Safe Night, and we actually put them into our um, donor tracking system as well as um, our newsletter, and so that way they stay up to date. Um, I, will, I will be honest, not 100% of them have continued to donate outside of Safe Night, but a lot of them have um, responded really well to our newsletters um, and invitations we've sent them. That's a great question. Great. Hi, th Thanks. This is, this is Suleyan. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to add. This isn't. Um, this is just something additional. But I wanted to point out um, that even if they don't convert into regular donors, we have consistent donors who continue to donate on Safe Night, even if they never become a donor in other, any other aspect with our agency. Thank you. Thanks for um, jumping in and sharing that. Um, what, what types of seasonal fundraising opportunities does Mosaic uh, employ, um, Sulan or, or Lee? So most of our fundraising, which and this might be the same for a lot of you, um, but we do a lot of our fundraising really from August to December. Um, so that's kind of like our main primetime fundraising season. Every year we host an annual gala. Um, that also includes um, a silent auction and a casino where we are able to raise um, extra funds off that. We also do a holiday campaign every year from November to the end of the year. Um, and then also one of the big things in the North Texas area is we do a giving day. So instead of us participating in um, something like Giving Tuesday, um, we have a Giving Day specifically for North Texas called North Texas Giving Day, um, where we have a foundation that will amplify some of our funds. So that's kind of like our um, prime fundraising. Thank you. And we had a comment that I just chatted out to everyone um, from Stella. Um, she, she uses an analogy how currently during the uh, election season, um, political parties are doing this, just asking for $5 or for $10. So um, she comments that it's very clever of you to do this and, and bring it into the nonprofit world. 
So um, thank you. And we still have opportunities for more questions. Does Mosaic participate in Giving Tuesday? Good question. Thank you. No, we do not participate in Giving Tuesday. Our reason for that is a couple of years ago we actually tried, and believe it or not, we got zero dollars on Giving Tuesday, um, which is actually quite embarrassing. But we actually realized that just the timing with everything, um, we were really burning out our donors and asking them for way too much in a very little time. Um, so that was one thing that we decided to take away from our fundraising plan. Yep. Thank you, and, and thank you for your honesty because I think all the other agencies on this call and that will listen to this recording will appreciate that. And I think you and I had talked about this, and Michael and I had talked about this, that sometimes when we have um, you know, fundraising events or opportunities, sometimes they're not always successful. And we can often learn from our mistakes just as well as we can learn from our successes. So the Safe Shelter Collaborative, which is the SSC, um, we, we often just say SSC, but the Safe Shelter Collaborative wants all of our agencies to know that you know, we're going to try to give you some background and some best practices from Lee and Michael, but sometimes it's it, that you may not always succeed the first time. And don't, don't worry about that. You should share that with the rest of the agencies so, so we can learn from your example. Um, another quick question um, is, does Mosaic have recurring monthly donors? Do you have a mechanism for that, um, Sulan and Lee? Yes, we have a few. Um, we definitely, that is something that we want to start rolling out and putting a lot of emphasis on in 2017. Um, we just signed um, a contract with a fundraising platform called Classy, which allows us to maintain and recruit uh, new monthly reoccurring donors, which we're really excited about. We've already actually had a few people sign up um, to do those donations, even though we haven't started promoting it yet. So it just gives you um, the back-end technology and tools to be able to set this up in an easy way instead of us going in manually and charging someone's card every month. Great. Thank you. So um, another question we have is, do you incorporate Safe Night into your domestic violence awareness activities? Because I know I mentioned that the SSC, or the Safe Shelter Collaborative, is for um, the survivors of human trafficking, but it's also for the survivors of domestic violence. Sorry, um, Lee, do you um, incorporate Safe Night into your domestic violence awareness activities? Yes, sorry, I wasn't sure oh, if you no, were that's okay. specifically <laughs> wanting someone to answer. Um, yes, we do. We do a lot of outreach and different activities um, throughout the year, but especially in October, just um, for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And so, again, that's one of the things that comes naturally to us that we talk about Safe Night. Um, anytime anyone asks, you know, what do you do whenever your shelter is full or whenever you run out of funds? So that's something we always bring up. Um, we also have developed um, outreach materials specifically that ha for Safe Night that has Safe Night's logo and the instructions on how to download it, but also Mosaic's logo on it as well um, to help promote us and to ensure that they sign up for us. Great. Thank you. And we are almost at the top of the hour, so we are going to be um, wrapping this up. I do want to make sure folks that have questions can continue to chat those while I, I do a little wrap-up so we can still in, engage, um, give you one more opportunity to ask those burning questions. Um, but as I mentioned before, we have an enormously compassionate and capable support team here. And they are happy to hear from you. And we have some resource. We have call or text 415-323-6283. You can also email us or visit us online. We do wish to continue to develop um, content that will be meaningful to you as agencies, whether you are a member of the Safe Shelter Collaborative or not. Um, we want to be there to support you. So it's important that you take the 
of maybe 30 seconds at the end of this presentation, when you X out of this or when we shut this down or you close out, you're going to get a survey. The survey has an opportunity for you to write as much or as little as, as you'd like. Um, there's a couple of questions we'll also ask you. Please do take this. It is optional, but we want to encourage you to do that so we can get better at doing this. Um, and we can engage with folks like Lee and Michael, our amazing presenters, um, more, more regularly and build um, content for you. So um, with that, I'd like to, to actually place a very sincere thank you to Michael and Lee. The time they have dedicated to spend with me um, in developing their presentations and honing them so it would be meaningful to you is significant, and they are both volunteers. So um, Caravan Studios and TechSoup really appreciates you, Michael and Lee. Thank you so, so much. And I also um, wish to give a huge shout out to Sulan. Um, she is incredible. She's, she does a lot of things. So I thank you so much for being on the call today to answer the questions and provide back end support. Thank you. Can I, can I actually say one last thing before? Absolutely. We the call? Um, Absolutely. I just want—I I know I didn't get—I didn't talk very much, so I apologize. Uh, jumping in here at the last minute, but I just wanted to say, you know, Lee had mentioned a lot of our initial hesitations, and I'm sure a lot of you guys, if you guys aren't already using Safe Shelter Collaborative, may have hesitations. Or I—I I just want to say that it is worth the time and effort it takes to incorporate the Safe Shelter Collaborative and incorporate Safe Night and working out everything because we've been able to not only gain new donors, but we've also been able to provide a service that we've never been able to provide before. And it it seemed like we had a lot of hesitations in the beginning, but it was all pretty relatively easy to figure out. And um, and so I just wanted to really put a push out there that if anyone isn't sure, we're more than happy. Feel free to touch base with us after this presentation. We're more than happy to help answer any other questions. But it's really changed the way that we've been able to do any kind of emergency funding and be able to um, have a new way of gaining new donors. So I think it's pretty incredible. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. That's nice of you to say. And um, we appreciate that feedback because we're always trying to get better. That's our goal is to serve your mission, help you serve your mission. So thank you. Um, and just lastly, a, a big thank you to Ricky and Tiffany and Sarah from Caravan on the back end for chatting things out and prompting your questions. Um, as we sign off now, I still see that most of you are on this call. So if you do have any last-minute questions, please plug those in there. Um, Michael and Lee, we will be um, sharing an email that will have their email addresses as well, so you can connect with them. Um, and thank you for your time. I know the most valuable thing many of you can give us is your time. So I really sincerely appreciate that. And we want you to have a great weekend. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.